Welcome to the 257th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with Richard Cohen, author of the book, How to Write Like Tolstoy, A Journey into the Minds of Our Greatest Writers. Stay tuned for the interview. This episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast is brought to you by Libro.fm. Libro.fm is the first and only company which lets you purchase audiobooks directly from your favorite local bookstore. Support your favorite local bookstore, and you can pick from more than 125,000 audiobooks, including New York Times bestsellers and recommendations from booksellers. You'll get the same audiobooks at the same price as the largest audiobook company out there. You know who I'm talking about, but you'll be part of a different story, one that supports your local bookstore. If you're new to audiobooks, they're the perfect way to get more books into your busy life. If you already love audiobooks and don't know what to listen to next, check out the recommendations and curated list from the people who know audiobooks best, your local bookseller. There's a special offer now for reading and writing podcast listeners. Get three audiobooks for the price of one, $14.99, with your first month of membership. Just use the code RWPODCAST. Again, that's Libro.fm, purchasing audiobooks from your local bookstore, and use the code RWPODCAST. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Richard Cohen, author of How to Write Like Tolstoy, A Journey into the Minds of Our Greatest Writers. Cohen is the former publishing director of Hutchison and Hoder and Stoughton and the founder of Richard Cohen Books. Works that he has edited have gone on to win the Pulitzer, Booker, and Whitbread Costa Prizes, and more than 20 have been number one bestsellers. Richard, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. So what led you to write How to Write Like Tolstoy? It was an odd development. Um, For about seven years, um, I was teaching as a a visiting professor at one of the universities around London, Kingston-upon-Thames, it's called, and which came about not because I'd taught creative writing before or even been a full professor, but because a friend of mine whom I published um, said, come on, Richard, you'll enjoy doing this. And he couldn't have been more right. I had a lovely time there um, and produced these lectures for audiences ranging sometimes about 12 to 150. And I was already commissioned to write another book, another non-fiction book called A History of Historians. But I decided rather stupidly to do two books at the same time. And in the process, the writing book really changed. If it began partly as a how-to book, um, and that's part of the structure of the book, it became more, as I went on, um, a look at the whole kind of canon of Western literature, fiction, Um, and the kind of problems that the main writers, the best novelists, came across and how they solved them, or sometimes how they failed to solve them. So um, this is a long answer, but it's trying to give you the the range of what happened. Um, That became the centre of the book. And then there was a third and final stage, which I suppose was me being mischievous, that even as I looked at these problems, various um, other ideas came to me. So um, I write about things like, why plagiarism is far more interesting than one sometimes thinks, or whether it's possible to write about sex in the novel um, over the times of restrictions and no restrictions, and kind of other things which certainly don't belong to a how-to book, but I hope make this volume the more interesting. Sure. Well, you, you mentioned uh, these main problems that writers have, have tackled, the best novelists. What, what are some of those problems? Well, I begin with simply the question of how to to start a novel. And over the centuries, it's been a continual problem. I think it's a problem for all artists, you know, whether it's the the painter looking at a blank canvas or the writer thinking, well, how do I begin this? And to what extent does the first sentence or the first paragraph dictate what happens afterwards? And novelists through the centuries have taken different views about how they can solve the problem. 
Well, as I mentioned previously, you had a long career as an editor. What originally led you to your career in book publishing? And I'm curious if you can remember your first job as in book publishing and editing. A mixture of desperation and serendipity. I would uh, read English at university. I'd begun reading law and decided I didn't like um, law or all the amount of work it entailed. And my girlfriend then studied English. That was that change. And then after university, like most arts graduates, I thought, what on earth do I do next? And I taught at a state school in London, a tough um, North London school for a while, not, not very long, just about a third of a year. And I was singing in a choir. And a girl in the choir said, Richard, why don't you try publishing? There's someone moving over from the hardback to the paperback side of William Collins, this London-based publisher. Um, and I, well, I've written to most publishers. I never wrote to them. She was pretty stupid of me, as they were the largest publishing firm doing general books in the UK. And anyway, I wrote to them, and they invited me in for an interview. And I suddenly found myself, without really any good experience at all, um, as a commissioning editor. I mean, 19, this is back in 1973, um, and asked to, well, initially I was handling a whole lot of books that have been authors taken on by um, other more senior members. But I remember I was asked to edit the novels of Alistair MacLean, who's rather like John Grisham or, or Patterson now, um, in that all his books shot to the number one spot in the bestseller list. And um, that was pretty frightening because MacLean who could be a very kind and thoughtful man, also had a problem with alcohol. And he'd often ring his publishers up when he'd had rather one too many. And I used to get summoned to attend to him in those, in those occasions. <laughs> well, you've, you've written an entire book about writing and the approach to writing by many authors. But if you were, if you were forced to distill your writing advice to beginning writers, are there basic writing tips that you would offer? There probably are, are a lot. Um, and as you can see from the last two longish replies, I could go on and on. Um, but then most of the, the um, pieces of advice I'd give, I'd probably contradict. You know, so murder your darlings or um, cut, cut, cut um, are very good pieces of advice. But then there are times when they ought to be uh, seriously ignored. Um, I think one of the things I'd say is, you know, if you give to an editor or just to a friend or an intelligent reader um, something you've you've written, and they make a suggestion you really disagree with, don't stomp off in a foul mood or curse them or whatever, um, because it may be that you're right, um, but that they have attended or something's worried them that they've not come up with the right answer to. So you ought to think, well, there's something wrong here, even if we haven't diagnosed it yet. Hmm. Interesting. Well, well, throughout your career as an editor, you worked on many bestseller, best-selling books. Are, are there any particular anecdotes or memories that stand out from your, your years as an editor? How long is this show? Um, <laughs> I, uh, well, I've done, I don't know, I haven't counted them up. I've edited I, perhaps over 300 novels and a lot of nonfiction, a lot of literary biography, a lot of biography. And I came to the States in 1999 and it's as if American publishers have decided that one of their missions in life is the further education of Richard Cohen, because I keep on getting given books on subjects I know little or nothing about, which have educated me, and God knows what the actual authors have thought of it. So that very early on, I was given the task of editing Rudy Giuliani's book, Leadership. And I remember being summoned to an interview with Giuliani, who had just sacked his previous editor, and his publishers were extremely nervous and went to me as a, a freelance editor, thinking, well, maybe this would be the solution. And I would learned something of Giuliani's uh, reputation, of you know, biting to shreds um, people whom he didn't approve of. But I thought, well, we've got two things in common. First, we were brought up by, Benedict, by religious orders. Um, I was educated by Benedictine monks. Um, and second, both our fathers had been boxers. My father was a heavyweight boxer. It's in that weight category from the age of 13 on. So that's what I talked about. I didn't talk about politics where we had very different views. I talked <laughs> about what it's like being brought up by um, a religious order and, and what our fathers were like in the ring. And uh, Giuliani rang up um, the publishers um, and said, yeah, he'll do. And we then had, I don't know, six months, nine months together, and we never had an argument. 
That's great. That's great. <laughs> so are, are there common mistakes that you see beginning writers making in their stories and manuscripts? Yes. I mean, I think that a writer who's any good will have things they do very well, or certainly well, things they do very badly, or certainly need editing, and then a range of things in the middle where um, they've got to revise, and you get good revisers and bad revisers. Um, and um, certainly, you know, a lot of authors, when they begin, um, suffer from things like clearing the throat. In other words, whether it's a beginning of a book or a new chapter, they'll say things which one can just say, look, leave that out. It's a certain degree of self-consciousness on your part. It doesn't help the story. It doesn't help characterization. I and mean, it's you just getting down to it in a rather long-winded way. Um, equally, I think writers have to learn to trust their reader, um, that it's best to write for, I won't say the perfect reader, but a reader who you feel is going to get the point of what you're up to. And most writers, when they begin, spell things out. And that can be either small things like the unnecessary adjective or adverb. He said crossly, um, she exclaimed blissfully, or whatever it might be, to larger cases where um, they just are scared of their reader not being able to appreciate what they're at. And so they'll underline points about the story or about character, which if they're writing well, um, are much better left at, at the shortened way, the, the shortened version. Sure. Well, you've spent your in, your your lifetime and career reading. What are you reading these days? Um, well, I have almost one book on the go in each room of the apartment. There's one in the in the bathroom. There's a, a whole mess in the bedroom. Um, I even have a paperback normally in the jacket that I walk around town in. That paperback is a result of um, a recent holiday in Sicily, and it's a detective novel called The Day of the Owl by a, a Sicilian lawyer um, who had a very public career um, tracing the assassination, kidnapping and assassination of the Italian president back in um, the 1980s. Um, but he also wrote um, a handful of wonderful detective stories. So that's my, my, this one is my first encounter with that. Um, a lot of my other reading is to do with the history of hist of historians that I mentioned. So I'm currently I'm completing a chapter on Shakespeare as a historian. So I've had the bliss of rereading Shakespeare. Um, and my next chapter is going to be on Arab historians. And um, I went to the New York Public Library last week and, of course, discovered that three quarters of the books I want to read are in Arabic, which I don't speak. So I'm puzzling that one over. But I don't think that will be on my list of books to read. So, so Elmer Leonard once published an essay about writing, 10 Rules for Good Writing. Some of his rules included never open with the weather, avoid prologues, never use a verb other than said to carry dialogue. So do you agree with his rules? Um, well, again, rules are for disobeying, even when they're sensible. So it was a dark and stormy night, the famous terrible ending, um, beginning rather, um, which even Snoopy um, uh, wrote and then revised, you know, isn't a bad uh, beginning. The trouble is that it's become a cliche that you open a story with a description of the weather. And one can think of some wonderful novels. Thomas Hardy, for instance, will describe the weather very early on in the story. So um, it's a funny rule. And there's some sense to it. But you've also, also got to say, um, well, the opposite can be true, too. Um, I think that um, Leonard's love of getting rid of adverbs is a very good rule, but there are some times when an adverb carefully placed will make a whole sentence sing. So um, I think Leonard's a wonderful writer, and I use him particularly when I've been teaching creative writing to um, a group of uh, high school students, and I use Leonard as an example of how to write wonderful dialogue. That's great. Well, in addition to your new book about writing, are there other books about writing and the craft of writing that you would recommend for aspiring writers? I think the one that, although I often disagree with him, um, I would recommend, I don't want to recommend too many. I think people should write rather than read about writing. Sure. Apart from my book, of course, um, is, Stephen, <laughs> is Stephen King's book on writing. 
um, which is partly autobiography. He wrote it after a terrible accident. He was out walking one day um, in his home state of Maine and was on a main road and a truck, which was out of control, hit him. And his list of injuries is horrendous. I put it in an early draft of my book and my editor at Random House said, take it out, it's too unpleasant to read. But anyway, while he was recuperating, recovering from that terrible accident, um, his mind turned to the art of writing, which is a past master. And he wrote this wonderful book, um, which talks about how he wrote over the years and changed his writing and um, sharpened his style, and the lessons he got as, as years went by. So that would be my number one recommendation. So you've mentioned several times your, the book that you're working on, The History of Historians. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I will, although probably um, my Random House editor and publicist will say, you're meant to be talking about Tolstoy. It's wonderful. Make people <laughs> like that. Um, when I was a publisher, I wanted to um, publish various books which hadn't been written because I wanted to read them. And I wanted um, to look at the world of historians because we get our ideas of the past from certain key figures. Um, and I couldn't find a book that looked at the, those figures in terms of what were their agendas, what were their private love lives, their, their rivalries, their health concerns, um, their patrons, and so on. Um, and all these things really influenced the kind of history they wrote and has come down to us. And I didn't want it to be about people with the tag historian after their name, because I felt well, the writers of the Bible wrote hugely influential history. What were their agendas? Who were they? Particularly the Old Testament writers. Shakespeare, as I've said, you know, people will say, well, he's not a historian, he's a playwright. But in his day, um, both Elizabethan and um, under James I, there wasn't such a hard and fast distinction. History was written by dramatists, poets, chroniclers, narrative writers, and so on. And we get a lot of our ideas about not just English history, but ancient Roman history from Shakespeare. And then, of course, there are, going back to the novel, there are writers like um, Tolstoy and Balzac, even up to Solzhenitsyn um, or Patrick O'Brien um, or Hilary Mantel, people who get hugely widely read um, and form our ideas about what the past was like and what the various characters in it were like. And all those writers... Um, as I say, had their own failings, their own prejudices. And it's been fascinating to read about them and now I hope to write about them. Great. Well, we'll look forward to that in the future. Well, again, we've been speaking with Richard Cohen, author of How to Write Like Tolstoy, A Journey into the Minds of Our Greatest Writers. The book is available in bookstores now, so go grab a copy. And Richard, thanks for doing this interview. Thank you.